Okay, we are live. Everyone, thank you for joining us today. We are so excited that you could tune in for this really, all right, let me turn my volume, that would help. Um, I am so excited that you could join us today for this very important discussion around domestic violence awareness. As you know, Love Life Now Foundation promotes year-round awareness against domestic violence. And we wanna keep the issue in the forefront as much as possible. You guys have heard me say before that we don't want the issue to be in the forefront when a um, an athlete is being profiled for it or a celebrity is in the news because of it. Um, we wanna keep this issue going as much as possible so people can understand um, that this issue spans across the board. It's happening all the time in the US alone. It's every nine seconds. And so tonight we're gonna to be touching on on one specific culture, and that is the Cape Verdean culture and the societal, societal norms that surround this issue. So I am so excited to have our guests tonight. Uh, they are a plethora of women that really sort of, first of all, have a firsthand sort of knowledge base around this issue in the Cape Verdean culture, but also they have a really great understanding of what awareness looks like when it comes to it. So I want to welcome our guests. Yes. Uh, and I'm going to start by introducing them, um, starting with Elisa Fonts. Elisa, if you can wave your hand for me so that everybody knows who you are. Oh, everybody clapped. I only want Elisa to wave her hand. Elisa, wave. <laughs> Perfect. So Elisa is, is like North America. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> Elisa Fonts is currently a Brockton Police Department officer. She is also a former domestic violence advocate for the department who continues to be very involved in the community. Welcome, Elisa. Then we have Lanera. Lanera, please wave your hand for folks. <laughs> Welcome, Lanera. Lanera is the founder of a project called Criola Empowering Criola. Her background is working with victims of domestic violence and sexual assault and has worked in the field for 13 years. That's a long time. First as a counselor, supervisor, then Penelope's Places shelter director, where she and I met while I was volunteering there. In 2001, she felt the need to get involved more with the community to empower Criolas by helping Cape Verdean women get familiar with and of their rights, regardless of their immigration status. Since then, through TV, radio, and social media, she continues to use her voice to spread awareness on the issues that matter to Criolas. Welcome, Lanera. <laughs> Next up, we have Candida Al, MSW who is currently working as a mental health clinician for correctional psychiatric services. She is excited to be on the panel as a black Criola and social worker. She has had the pleasure of helping survivors of both domestic violence and sexual assault when she also worked at Health Imperatives, which oversees the Penelope Place uh, Domestic Violence Shelter as a bilingual counselor and advocate from 2016 to 2018. As a social worker, she has used her language skills to provide prevention education lectures to Brockton students who migrated from different countries throughout the world. She has also had the pleasure of working with multidisciplinary agencies to educate and assist many individuals who were leaving abusive relationships or survivors. Thank you, Candida. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> and last up, we have Tina Cardoso. Tina, please wave your hand. <laughs> Tina is a city councilwoman at large in the city of Brockton, Massachusetts. She's also a registered nurse and founder and executive director of Cape Verdean Women United, a nonprofit organization in Brockton, Massachusetts, committed to violence prevention education, as well as providing related resources, resources to its residents. Thank you, Tina, for joining us. Um, I am just, I mean, again, I am really excited because this has been on my heart to really do something like this. And, and first of all, I reached out to Tina and Tina said, you know what, I'm down, but here's the other women that can really um, lend to this conversation as well. So I'm really excited to have all of you here tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you. 
So I'm not going to waste any time. I want to jump in. We're going to we're going to talk for about an hour, hour, 10 minutes. But I really want to jump into the issues at hand. Um, first of all, domestic violence is a willful act. It's not something that someone does one time. It's a pattern of behavior that is perpetuated through power and control. So I want to put that out there, just sort of the general scope meaning of what domestic violence is. When it comes to the Cape Verdean culture, um, I'd like for any of you to, to, to touch on what, what the legacy of silence that's been passed down from generations to just sort of deal with it, deal with the abuse. What is that in, 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 in general culture? What is, what is that about? Any of you? I, oh, go ahead, Tina. I'm going to speak first because you ladies have much more experience than I do in the field. So I figure if I go first, then, you know, I'll be safe, right? <laughs> so, Laverne, <laughs> I want to thank you for doing this. Um, it's so important, especially with everything that's going on with COVID-19. Um, we yeah. have kind of stepped away from dealing with this issue for a little bit um, because of all that we've had to do to support our residents with COVID and with resources. But we know that this issue uh, continues. And if anything, it's probably worse during this time where kids are at home for the last almost six months in these situations and not able to access their teachers to get the help that they need. And we know that teachers are super important in helping us in this work because sometimes they're the first ones to identify that there is a problem in the home and then they bring it to us. So I thank you. And I love that you titled this uh, program Code of Silence because we know that that speaks volumes in our community. We know that there's a code of silence when it comes to everything, not just DV, sexual abuse, uh, depression, anxiety, anything that has some kind of stigma, there's a code of silence. Absolutely. So, I, I loved, when I saw that, I was like, how perfect. Um, so I appreciate that. And like I said, the ladies on this call, they've been doing this work for a long time. They're well-informed, well-versed. Uh, I'm glad that Elisa's here to bring in the, the perspective from the law enforcement. Lenita working at Brockton Neighborhood for so long, bringing that perspective. And Candida, we know her expertise in the in the field is impeccable. And so we have a great panel. I look forward to the discussion. I'd like to, to hear more from, from you all around the culture, some of the gender roles that kind of perpetuate violence. I'd love to talk about that. Um, you know, how those roles support violence. And, and then especially warning signs. We always talk about warning signs for everything that we feel like this community still has yet to grasp. When should they call? When should they alert someone that a family member or friend is in, in trouble? Um, and so I think that, you know, if we can kind of guide the conversation around some of that stuff would be super important. I'd like for us, if you ladies do not mind, I'd like to take a moment of silence for our brother, Elder Fernandez, who passed away, um, you know, a, 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 a sergeant, an officer who went to serve our country. And then, you know. So initially, you know, this sort of all started with him reporting. Um, sexual abuse by his superior. So very fitting right now, regardless. Um, but yes, a, a moment of silence, please. Thank you, Tina. Um, and so you know, going back, and that was a great sort of synopsis, Tina, and, and thank you for doing that. I want to touch on um, you know, like I said, the legacy of that silence that's been passed down from generation to generation to just deal with the issue of abuse. It isn't right, um, but what does that what does that all stem from? Lanita, you want to talk? <laughs> yes, um, I just want to I just want to give my opinion for what I've been seeing all this year. You know, as a Cape woman, uh, when we go way, way, way back, when we talk about the time of her, of my mother, my grandmother, where 
women didn't have like a voice. Women couldn't make a decision. You know, you depend on a man to make a decision. You depend on a man to you depend on a man financially. So we've been seeing that it, it feels like it's passing generation to generation. I can talk about the new generation because new generation, as some of them are very uh, different. But I see women, uh, the victims that I, I see, you know, oh, my mother, I, I saw my mother, you know, taking care of my dad and being abused by my dad, but she never, he, she never report to somebody. Now, back, there, back down there, who are you going to report? You want to go to the police, you want to go to the family, and family's going to send you back to your, to your, to your abuser. Because in the Cuban, in the Cuban culture, if you go to your mother, if you go to your mom, you tell your mom you're having a problem with your husband. Your mom, this is the thing your mom is going to say. This is your husband. You have to go home and listen to him. Everything is going to be fine. And if you go to some of the priests, the priest is going to tell you, you marry until, you know, dad do, do you a part. Uh, you're going to be fine. It's just a little problem. You're going to be fine. Knowing that you're not going to be fine because the abuse has been happening so many years. And then now you have uh, 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 even uh, like family members telling you they, they need to sit down and talk to you or the priest need to sit down and talk to you. So imagine you go sit down with your abuser in front of the priest or in front of your family member, knowing that you already you already took the whatever the secret, the code of silence, the silence that you had at home. So now you're taking outside. You're speaking with somebody outside where people now know about your problem. Yeah. So I see a lot of people being scared to report because it feels like it's a norm. Okay, well, my mother took it, my family took it. Oh, I'm gonna go to my family and talk about it, but you know, they're gonna send me back to to my husband, or you know, I'm gonna go to my sister's house and stay there, or to my mom's house and stay there for a while, but I'm gonna end up going back to the abuser because my family, the community, the society is pushing me back to him. Yes. If I could jump into what Anita is saying is that um, being raised a K ready woman here in the United States. One, there's two factors that I've um, faced myself and I've also seen with clientele. And for those watching or those on the panels who can relate to this. So number one is that, and again, in most cultures, they say this is a family issue. Mm -hmm. Most family issues can be resolved. But another thing that's very, very upsetting is in the converting culture, some people, are just worried about what other people are going to think or say. Yeah. A big stigma. They're so worried. Instead of focusing on the issue at hand, they were, what are my neighbors going to say? What's my sister going to say? What's who I was going to say? So that's one factor. Another factor is, um, so I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought there. Another factor that I find that, that people come across is when they do report how how do we deal with it? it whether it could be domestic violence um so the stigma so of if i come out and i say i'm being abused keep in mind that there's been a silence that quota silence is for years that i'm not supposed to report that sometimes we are, are taught that it's okay to go through these things it's the after effect of once you disclose it that that whole process how we're going to deal with this process another barrier yeah. Your thoughts. Yeah. Candida, you want to jump in on that? Yes. I think that within the K Virgin culture, it's rooted with, you know, generations because as we know with violence in itself, sexual and domestic violence on a psychological basis, which it, when we talk about mental health and the stigma of it, right? Um, it starts at a young age when mm -hmm. you, you basically are the role model of your right. children. Yeah. So if you're a mother in a domestic violence, whether it's a verbal dispute, whether it's an emotional, because we know that with domestic violence, there's different factors, not only the physical and the sexual aspect of it, which it starts with the emotional and psychological. And that's what people don't consider as violent, which is uh -huh. actually one of the most dangerous kind of form of violence because yep. it leads a lot to suicide and depression. So as a kid itself, if you see that, you kind of internalize it and you normalize it and 
as an adult, it's like, well, my mom, my sister, my aunt has gone through it, so I can tolerate, it's tolerable, right? And then we see sort of the scale and escalate into where it becomes dangerous. And that stigma, m most often it comes from that machisto kind of culture mindset, right? Yeah. You know, the male controls the house, the woman has this and the structure and that structure, right? And we see that it's prevalent today. And with this new generation, it's still a, a really debatable kind of topic right now because, you know, as as myself, I can speak for myself, you know, I'm a young woman that I can break that through that, but there's family members who are still in that mindset. So it's really hard when you are trying to address a matter of this. And there's a saying in the Cape Verde culture that really, really frustrates me. You know, if you make your bed, you have to lay in it. Yeah. That, that, that mindset, right? And sort of that, that's embedded within us. And, you know, through my experience, even young kids, like I think that within, sort of growing up in that household where not even a household but around you your environment your neighbors right if your neighbors are screaming for help you're like oh god here they go again but it's not yep. business let's close the door right you know, that affects you as a kid you know um so i think it starts at a young age and that's generational kind of psychological effect right and with studies i'm not sure i'm not saying it's completely accurate but if you witness domestic violence or any form of violence within your house you're more likely to become a victim of violence if you don't change that cycle within you. But it, 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 it becomes ingrained in you. It becomes internalized in some ways. And I think that, you know, over the years, the culture is still struggling with that in today's day. Yeah. And it's so true because um, those uh, generational issues sort of stem from, you know, the top down. If you see you know, you learn what you, you are, what you learn, right? And you learn these, these behaviors from a very, very young age. Um, China Dolores says, very normal to be quiet about what is going on with you. You never get the help that you need. Um, Imani says, yes, this is a generational, this is generational rooted in the patriarchal, patriarchal TV culture. Um, and then Caleb says, yes, the mental abuse is not looked at because there's no physical scars. Very true. And yeah. so with all of this happening um, and being portrayed in a home, you a lot of the time you have no other way of, of being in relationships. Um, that's all you know. Okay. And it's frustrating to those on the outside looking in because the first thing you say is that would never be me. But you don't know what type of setting this person came from. You don't know what they grew up in. You don't know what they learned as love. Um, and that that in itself is, is frustrating. So thank you guys for touching on that. Um, the next question that I had was- uh, Can you say you know, something before? Throw an air on, jump in. I want to touch base a little bit about verbal and um, psychological abuse mm -hmm. because this is this is one of the one of the things that key veteran women don't talk about it because they don't consider is abuse. Yeah, so they consider physical abuse, and they don't really consider um, verbal or psychological abuse, mental abuse. If you talk to key veteran to some of the key veteran women. Uh, you tell them, oh, do you ever, this is abuse. No, no, he never, he never really bit me. He never really, you know, physical did anything to me. But when you, when you tell them, okay, so can you just give me an example of some of the things that he said to you? So the name calling, the, 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 the manipulation, the, all these other stuff that women that sometimes it degrades you, it puts you down, your self-esteem yeah. is so down. Well, some woman is okay with it because it's nothing that physically touched them. You know, yeah. they mark them over their body. So but we normalize it. We yes. make it normal mm -hmm. in our culture. Yeah. But, but also grown up, and like I said, I, I was obviously born in K Red, but raised here. But just thinking of my parenting skills, sometimes as our parents, they use words, right? And I, and I don't think they were so meaningful of it. But just the words that they use, especially with females in the household. Um, mm -hmm. And I always questioned, I was that child that questioned, like, well, how or why are you saying these things to me? I mean, right. I kind of feel maybe their outlook on uh, a point of why they're saying it, but it was so crucial to the words that they're saying. And I, as I got older, 
I did question my mom very carefully saying like, why did you use those words? Cause you know, those words are very hurtful. I know you didn't mean them. And it all goes back to, it was used within her generation. Um, so it is, so I said, that's not okay. So if you're calling it like, for example, for girls down to date or girls down to hang out and you call a girl out of her name, that it's not right. So even in parenting in the Cape Verdean culture, some of the words that they use, like, um, another thing with mental health, like, oh, he's crazy or she's crazy. Some of the wording that is used even in parenting, I think culturally they think it's okay to use those words when it's not. Yeah. And it's passed down, right? Because I've used them with my kids and I've had my kids come to me as they got older and said, mom, sometimes you would say things to me, I'd rather you have uh, hit me. I would rather you hit me yeah. than say the things that you said. But we learn this behavior and it, it's passed down from generation to generation and we normalize it and we don't think that it's it's abuse. We don't that's think- a great, That's a great point that you just, I wanna touch on something you just said, Tina, because you said that your kids called you out at times for certain mm -hmm. words that you use. There's mm -hmm. some kids that cannot ever step to their parents and do that. Correct. I don't know what culture it is, right? We're talking about CV culture, but I think that goes across the board and that's really um, beneficial to touch on. Everything that you guys said is spot on, right? Um, and, and so my question is, because tonight is all about not just talking about what the barriers are, not just talking about what the problems are, but providing resources that people can actually use once we're done with this conversation. So what do you say to the, the children that are growing up in homes that, you know, hear these words uh, or notice that these behaviors are not normal um, and they want to question them? What what kind of resources out there for them to be helped? Or for them for, for a way for them to find to find a way for them to approach their parents about what's going on? Well, nowadays you have um, not only when we, you know, let's take a the CV the culture. I should have said I should have said that. <laughs> yeah, well, nowadays you have school, so a lot of the resources come from school. If you go to the doctor's appointment, any doctor's appointment now, there's uh, um, I, I find it a little bit funny, but it's not funny in the sense, but. It's funny that, wow, they're asking these questions that before when you came to the doctors, they're, not, they're asking you were safe at home um, and there's a trickle of other questions that they ask. But there's resources out in the community. My only, not concern, my only, I guess it is a concern is that there's that trust factor, mm -hmm. that language factor. Um, because when you're bringing in a translator at times, they're not familiar with the translator. And now not only you're telling the doctor, you're, you're telling this translator, or you can tell this officer that you have no idea of who you know, he or she is about your issue. So it's like you're slowly bringing down that barrier to start to say, you can confide in me and you have to take my word and only time can tell how this is gonna be built up to um, to learn that you can trust me in what you're gonna tell me. And trust me, even that, at that point, your trust level has to be built. So yeah. it's a little slippery slope though, Laverne, because um, you know, we, it's it's fragile because if kids go and report stuff like this, then D, D, DCF is involved, and then it's all this other stuff, right? We and that's some of the stuff we'll touch on later. And you're very right, right? right? So right. reporting, you know, those are some of the barriers that keep them for, keep folks from reporting. But you know, I know specifically um, that Tina, you have a support group, right? That yeah. um, right that you know if folks right within the Brockton community if they feel like they want to talk about an issue that's affecting them surrounding the issue of sexual assault and domestic violence they can come there and be safe and i you know there have to be i know there are other um support groups not other support groups but other outlets not necessarily like that, but that exists, right? So mm -hmm. your local, you know, someone that you may know that might be a cop, that's that's kind of rare, but you know, there's a Lisa in the community. Um, there is your, your, your neighborhood health center person, right? Um, anybody that you think it not on a, not, you know, not on a professional level, but someone that you know in the community that you feel okay with to go and say something to them and have them, you know, either keep, not keep it confidential, but kind of guide you in the direction of the way that you should go, especially well, when you're concerned a parent. 
Right. Well, I think that's what I was um, kind of leading to is we need more programming. I was just saying to Alisa and Lenita um, that we we were doing things periodically to educate around these issues. And I know COVID-19 hit and we haven't been able to do our community doesn't do well with this platform of Zoom, you know, mm -hmm. and virtual. virtual where we, yeah. we like to get together and gather and see each other and touch each other. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so we educate better that way when we can actually see people. Um, so hopefully, I'm hoping that we can get back to some kind of normal because I think education is key. And, and instead of, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, instead of um, trying to how do I put it? We can't fix things overnight. These norms yeah. exist in our, in our cultures. It's yeah. step by step, little by little. Yeah, you know, Tina, I think, I think that, sorry to interrupt you, I think it's important because when I was thinking earlier about uh, what I forgot that I wanted to say, just came back to mind as Tina was speaking, is that I like to work on the prevention side of it, many of you right. guys, right? So I don't want to get a phone call saying my sister just was just murdered or I was just beat up, right? I wanna get a phone call saying, how can you help me? And this right. is gonna be all confidential. Right. Um, because that lack of, um, we call right. it, it's not ignorance, is it, right. it's not so much that is that, um, I don't wanna get the phone call, oh, my sister's been abused for, for the past five years, and we knew about it, but we didn't know what to do. So right. I want to work on the prevention side. So if you don't know what to do, and sometimes it doesn't have to involve the police or courts, it can be just safe planning. How do we mm -hmm. safe plan to save a life, right? Right. So I like to work on the prevention side versus yes. getting a call that we're going to a murder scene or we're going to a scene where a girl has been beat up badly and we have to meet with her in a hospital. So working on prevention and program and educating the community on, on like you said, all the resources, is, I think it's a very, very major uh, uh, focus that we need to focus on um, within the community of here are all the, the, the places you can go, the resources you can have because, and again, it's not to uh, minimize people's comfort level of, of reporting, but don't say you didn't know, or don't tell me that, um, you know, when you, the neighbor upstairs is getting beat up, that you know what you can do, because you can do things privately. You don't, when you call the police, you don't have to disclose that the neighbor downstairs is going to call us. We can just say, listen, a neighbor called us. We can be very creative in, in terms of keeping it safe for the um, person who did make the call. So yeah, like be identified, but working on the prevention side versus last resort, as such as phone calls. And Lisa, you and Lenita, you guys, imagine how long it took you to build the trust in the folks so that they can come to you. It takes a long time to build trust. Like yeah. our, our community does not trust easily. I remember when I started doing the women's support group, one person would come. Sometimes nobody would come. And yeah. then it took a time for people to build that trust. And then all of a sudden it grew and more people started coming. But it wasn't easy. I had to go in there and let them know that I wasn't going to go on Facebook and post their stuff. Exactly. That, I gonna, you know, that I wasn't going to judge them. That I was going to listen and help them. And that's right. what time is not easy. So I think not. one of the things I think one of the things that we need to really keep mentioning that we need to let the, the victims know that it's okay. You know, it's okay for them to look for somebody that they 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 trust, but in the same time, we need to teach them how to build that trust. Because you know, when you think about it, and most of the victims that you, that I talk to and Lisa talked to because sometimes we work with the same uh, victims. It's like, okay, the, the community are so small. So because the community are so small, so they think that because you know their family, you're going to go back and go tell their family that they call you, they told you this and this and that. No, we take our job very professional. We mm -hmm. here to help people. And if you call us and then you, because most of the time when people call me, you might tell me that you're Maria and then you, you whatever, you can be Carla, whatever. I don't really need to know your name. Anonymously, I'm right. Me. I'm here to help you. But if you call me, you tell me that somebody's threatening you, that somebody's doing the other, other stuff with you. That's something that we need to talk more about it to see how we can protect you. But we're here to help. We're here to help. 
We want victims to please, you know, come to us, talk to us about it. We are all professional here. We take the job very, very, very serious. We can all go out in the radio, on Facebook, or about the neighborhood, anywhere, and talk about who spoke with us, this and this and this and that. Yeah, and so um, I'm, I'm going to touch on, so all great points, all sort of great factors. The one thing that I'm going to um, add is that if you feel like you are ready to disclose what's happening in your family um, and you're trying to seek help, always, I mean, try to find out what the nearest domestic violence agency is in your area. We have a lot of people watching from different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it may not be specific to Brockton, Mass. But in Brockton, Mass, we want you to know there's support as well, right? And so finding out what the domestic violence agency is, that's a great place to start. Because A, they're not going to get your kids taken away. They're not working towards that. They're going to work towards getting you safe, getting your family safe. Um, and, you know, sort of making sure that you're okay. Um, and so I, I want to talk about a couple of the comments that we've had come on here. Um, K Love, actually, Elisa Adri Adriana says, How do we include undocumented members of the CV community in accessing mental health resources? And in conjunction with that same question, I'm going to go to the other, not other questions, but other comments. Um, someone asked, um, actually, China asked, Is there anyone on the panel that is a therapist? And I believe Candida is our ding ding right there. So you have a trusted person on the panel, Creola, black woman of color that you can reach out to. We're going to be providing the contacts for each of these people, each of these great women on the panel. So please stay tuned for that as well. Um, and then- Laverne, if I can say this too, Candida hasn't said it, but I was very impressed when we were in court one day, she's also fluent in Spanish. That yes. bring that up because I was so impressed. <laughs> Every yes. Spanish, so it really, really helps when you have a clientele that is Spanish and you look over to Candida and she's speaking to them fluently in Spanish. And that helps because, and this goes to the other comment that I'm going to say. K Love says, I wanted to go work with the court or to get help, I, I think she means, but they had no safe place for me to go. But she went back, right? She didn't stop there, she kept going back. When you go to to court, and I've seen this a number of times, when people go to court, ha some of the times the courts are so bogged down, there's no interpreter available. So Candida, for you to be fluent in Spanish, Portuguese, and to be able to speak those languages is helpful, right? Um, not necessarily there because you're working for the courts, but you're, you're there to help, right? And um, that's so important because people get so... Um, the deterred from seeking help because there's nobody there that speaks the language. And also the court system in itself. So mm -hmm. when we think about going to court, right? If you're going yep. to court for a traffic light, you're nervous, you're not, yep. you have anxiety, you're shaking. Imagine mm -hmm. confronting your abuser. If you're going up in front of a judge to renew a restraining order to, or to even pre-trial trial, because some of the cases do go farther as trial dependent on the circumstances, right? Yep. And I think that with certain um, agency, specifically the one I worked with in the community, I was that emotional support, knowing that there's someone there, not a family member, but someone who is in bias, who just sees you and is there to tell you to breed. Yeah. Or to just you can do it. You can do it because there's women or men who I I walk through and they're like, I can't do this. But when you're there to physically support someone emotionally, psychologically, and then empower them to get through this, and it's a forever changing moment. Yes. Because that moment will make or break because you can go back. Like right. the individual said, you can go back because you're too afraid. And managing the court system is really frustrating. It like, is frustrating. Really frustrating. It's it's level, like, yeah, I've been there on a personal level. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have a that's why, that's I why I that's why I that's why I mentioned Candida because that's what something that we were facing is that um the client was very intimidated. So here yeah. it is like you said you're going into court and you're nervous so you need the support but it's also a safety issue because you don't know if the other party that's in the court is going to intimidate you not to go forward because we've had plenty of cases now you're oh, in yeah. court that's why a lot of times now it's part of the reason why cell phones are not um allowed into wow. the court is because yeah. they're trying to intimidate the victim whether it's the defendant or family members who are there so 
having a social worker and have and the police department still offers that even though I'm, I'm no longer the advocate for the department we do have a new advocate um so just so that people know that if you're having those issues safety concern and just for support that the police department can support you in doing that just for safety purpose um so that they can, like again we like to work on the prevention side of things mm -hmm. Yeah, and and in that same context, so Elisa is a, a currently a Brockton police um, officer. She was a former um, domestic violence liaison for the department. Um, but what I want to point out as well for other folks that are listening in from other parts of the country is that you can call up your police department and find out who your domestic violence um, liaison is. Uh, many of the departments do have liaison liaisons like. Elisa, um, and I know the department at one point had two, two, uh, two women that were uh, one Haitian and Elisa, who's Cape Verdean. Um, but call up; don't be deterred by the fact that you know, or or scared of the fact that you're going to go into the situation and you don't even know where to begin because you're intimidated by the whole idea of talking to police. There usually is uh, somebody there that is a, a domestic violence department that can help you. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, Laverne, so I, Laverne, sorry yeah. to interrupt. But just somebody made mention to mental health resources for undocumented people. Yeah. I wanted to ask um, um, Lenita about that because I got that question today from someone else. Because uh, okay. a lot of the um, folks, if they don't have mass health, oftentimes they don't qualify for mental health. Um, services. Lenita, do you know anything about that? Well, uh, if patient has mass uh, as free care, patient can mm -hmm. still qualify for a therapist or service with mental health. So, because um, I know the private offices won't take them. Brockton neighborhood does that. We have a mental health, uh, behavioral health on the fifth floor. And okay. uh, I know in the community is not a lot of uh, therapists, mm -hmm. not organization that takes that in the list. The waiting list is so long, so but it is service for undocumented people, and of course, it's not a lot of service, and the service is limited, but it is service for mental health. That's fantastic and, and really important for folks to know too. Um, just because you have free care, that does not mean you're you're gonna be this you're gonna be um, not qualified for yes. mental health. Yes. And you know, to Tina's point earlier that a lot of people um, you know, really or, or within the culture, they really sort of miss that in person or don't know how to access services, that also goes hand in hand for, for therapy, right? So let's talk about therapy real quick. Let's touch on therapy. We don't okay. believe in therapy. Oh my God. We need therapy. If Perhaps the culture will need it, but we do believe therapy. in therapy. <laughs> right? We do Our because the culture be does <laughs> right. And so I'm, I'm not Cape Verdean. I am, a, uh, I was born in, in Trinidad, lived there for 15 years. I've lived in, in the States since 1993, but even there, the Caribbean, Caribbean folks do not yes. believe in that. Black people do not Black believe in therapy. therapy. Therapies for crazy people. They're right. you not crazy. We don't need them. And the more you try to educate the Cape Verdean community, that therapist is not for crazy people. You can go to therapist, you can go to somebody, you can talk about what's going on with you. It's yeah. somebody that you can go, you can talk about it without judging you, without pointing fingers, without doing nothing. And that person stays there with your problem, you go home. Yes. But we're still working on it. You know? Yes. And and that's the whole process, but we're getting there. Right. But I think that there's a stigma around mental health. So All together. When Look. we talk about mental health, everyone has mental health, whether it's good mm -hmm. or bad. It's sure. finding that balance within our mental health. Because if you're not taking care of yourself, you're under abusive relationship, you're stressed, you are going to fall into anxiety, depression, or even, you know, a psychotic episode because it does happen. Our brain can only tolerate so, so much. much. So if, when we talk about mental health, every single human on this earth has mental health yep. some form or other because we all have gone through stresses in our mm -hmm. lives mm -hmm. so that can trigger anxiety depression ptsd some form of mental health uh, some of us are able to deal with it hailed from it cope with it in a healthy way finding supportive families environment yes please unfortunately some don't where they lead to alcohol drugs or other lifestyles right but when it comes to the converting community they're like oh i'm not crazy i'm like 
what is crazy? Right, we right. We all have mental health. We all right. be stressed. If you I migrate know. from Cape Verde in the winter, in the winter time to come to America, you are under stress. You right. have to form the mental health <laughs> because the whole climate is cold. You go right. from really hot, sunny to not seeing the sun, and there's such a thing as seasonal depression. Absolutely. And I think that when it comes to that stigma, it's like when I actually educate clients and people, and when I do prevention education, I'm like, if you tell me you have no mental health we should have an interesting conversation that's the problem, right that right? in itself is a discussion yeah. and so when you think about it if you want to think about, I know, I, if you want to think about it in this sense when you talk about your physical health you go to a doctor sure, when you yeah. talk about your spiritual health you go to church to get that filled mental health needs to be let out too right you can't keep that in anything that's happening on the inside does not have to stay bottled up. It yeah. must be regurgitated and, and and spewed out so that you can unpack what, what's happened to you as it relates to trauma, right? Yeah. Or abuse overall. You cannot yeah. keep that stuff bottled up. It just, that is going, that's the thing that's going to make you crazy. Let's talk yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Laverne, gonna make Laverne, you crazy. I'm sure um, Candida can touch up on this, is that, you know, these women and men, we have to say there are men also who are victims. Yes, they are. Yeah. Uh, self-esteem plays a big factor. You yeah. know, you have a flower that is all of a sudden is dead in a sense, right? Mentally, that flower is dead. And you not only you build in trust, I find it true that, that you're building some type of self-esteem for these women because they've been broken down for so many years. Yep. And now you're trying to build that up. And their self-esteem is extremely, extremely low because yes. of all the words they've been hearing either whether it's from parenting or whether it's from their spouse or abuse or whatever the case may be. It could be from work. Uh, it could be because they hear they're undocumented. It's so many, um, so many factors is that you they need to build that self-esteem yeah. so they can move forward because if they can't build that self-esteem, so you're helping them, you're wearing many hats and what you have to do is refer them out to Candida or to the Health Center or where there is research. If I don't have mass health, I'm here undocumented. What can I do? So just to go back on undocumented um, people who are here, you still have rights, even though you don't have a status here, whatever the status may be. We're not worried about status because um, a lot of times people too don't come, don't report what they issue because they think we're immigration. We're definitely going to touch on that, Elisa. For real, yeah, violence. we'll touch on that. So the, their self-esteem is so low that not only that you're you're building, you're trying to build the person who they was to get comfortable enough to leave to go forward with whatever problems that they're facing. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. so glad. I'm so glad you mentioned that because it goes back to the gender roles that I talked about. And, and, and if we can touch on the gender roles, because that plays a big part in how women are treated yeah. and, and how our self-esteem, especially as black women, we are charged with so much. You yeah. know, we are told that we have to be quiet and just take it and be strong. Protect our men. Right. And take care of our men. And this it's is true. what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to cook. We're supposed to clean. We're supposed to hold the house down and all of this other stuff. And so I think that for some cultures, especially our, I can speak for our culture, that that really breaks us down and it kills yeah. our self-esteem. And so when we're put in these situations, we don't know how to lift ourselves. We don't know how to, to take care of ourselves. So I'm glad you guys have mentioned that. If we can touch a little bit on that, would be great. And therapy yeah. oftentimes is a it's a balance for some people. Mm -hmm. Even if yeah. you have nothing going on in your life, what we know about life is that sometimes it strikes you. You can yeah. be having a beautiful life family, but it's your space. Think about it. It's your own personal space to vent, to have someone to listen to you who is not biased, who is not your mom to tell you, you know what? Yeah, you guys will be okay. Just give him some time or give it some time or a yeah. week or two. But or pray about it. Oh, pray. Go to church and pray. I say you can pray and go to church and still have a therapist, which is right. actually better because yeah. there are therapists who actually focus on that religious concept. Yeah. Like, Absolutely. You know, the pray and display got that a lot. Because mm -hmm. I'm outspoken. Yes. And I that would be you. <laughs> yep. And I and oftentimes if you're not doing the quote unquote, the basic once you become a mother, for example, that's it. 
that's your role. I cannot have a, a, a doctor's degree and have be a mother and be an athlete no. because that's not right. normal, right? Right, you're yeah. broken. Because now you're trying to do too much. You're trying right. to show off. You're trying to do this. You're trying you to do that. And that. Like, yes, and as black women specifically with our own bodies, shapes, and, and feeling co comfortable within ourselves because society degrades us so much on an yep. everyday basis, right? And then when you're getting degraded from the person you love, the person right. that you trust, the man that's supposed to protect you, yep. or woman is now hurting you. Mm -hmm. How yep. that deteriorates your self-esteem. And oftentimes that's where people lose themselves. Yeah. Lose themselves completely even to suicide, drugs, right? But the the the, the structure of converting culture is the role. Like women are supposed to reach certain levels of their lives, and that's it. And yep. if you go above and beyond, you become a threat. Yes. Yeah. But why is that? Why? Mm -hmm. Right. 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 And so that's a myth, right? Right yeah. here, we want to disband that myth. Yeah. That's the myth. You're not doing too much. You're not broken. You're not showing off. You are being. You're a physical being. And there's more to you than making babies. It's it's so bad that other women start to believe that and they'll right. even say it. And even your own mother right. will say that, that to you. Pass you know, down, right? This is what we're talking like, about. The legacy yeah. passed down. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I think there were some comments um, that folks made then in reference to that too, what you guys are talking about. So that was good. Yeah, absolutely. I want to tie in. I want to keep the conversation going, but also invite. I'm um, uh, people are, are really like really delving in and and giving a lot of comments. So I'm excited about that. Imani says, "Can you speak to the challenge that victims face when they own when the only resolve they have or they feel that they have is to leave the community, their families, and their friends? This mm -hmm. becomes a point where victims often give up and stay in dangerous situations. So that's some of the re that's you know so." a reason that why people stay because they feel like they have to leave the whole community out of shame um, and blame. Um, and then she also says the concept of suicide is used to, is used to dismiss and romanticize depression to Candida's point. Um, and there's, there's nothing sexy about um, suicide. Okay. No. That is not your only choice. Um, and talking it out is where that comes into play. Um, there's a great resource that I'd like to point out. And again, all of these resources that we talk about are gonna be pointed um, and put in the comment section when we are done. Uh, I love the organization called uh, Samaritans Inc. They're out of Boston and it's a 24 seven hotline that you can pick up the phone and call and just talk about anything. They're not therapists, they're just, uh, it's just somebody on the other line that is there to listen for hours if you have to. Um, and I just want to put that out there because, you know, sometimes fe people feel like they have to put everything on social media, right? And that really isn't solving your problem. Yeah. Um, and this may not solve your problem either, but at least you're getting it out. Um, and, and I want to put that out there. So I'm at Samaritans Inc. And they're right in Boston that you can call 24 seven. So anyway, we're going to move on. Um, we are going to go to the next question that I have. Uh, we talked about the support in place. And so the fear of reporting, this is a big one. In the in the Cape Verdean community, what have you seen? And I'm going to start with um, uh, Elisa, and then I'm going to jump to Tina in terms of the fear of reporting um, domestic violence or sexual assault. What are some of the fears that you've seen, Elisa? The fears that I saw is basically what the thoughts are of what people are going to think of them. So you know, blame people, or shame. Yeah, they're so worried about what their family is going to think, uh, what people in general are going to think. And I've, I've learned this, you know, as I went through my job and I continue to tell people, but why don't you focus on the issue that you're facing versus worrying about what other people are thinking? You know, big, big factor. They're so worried about what people, and then what they also are worried yeah. about is the process through the court system. Like Candida says, when they go into court, they have no idea what to expect, and they're so nervous. Um, there's a language barrier because we have to go through the process of getting an interpreter. So now they're they're repeating their story through an interpreter. So he's another face that they have to obviously include into their story. Um, and also the resources in terms of 
for an example, if, if you have a victim who wants to relocate out of Barton, how do, how how does she or he relocate? So it comes. The funding is a big factor when someone is relocating because it is it's, it's a financial burden. Um, but if if the victim decides to stay, and just know that there's a restraining order. You can go and get a restraining order. Um, when you're working with, that's why it's very good to say get to know your domestic violence advocate and your police department because they can accompany you so every step. I sat in living rooms with the victim and the defendant. And he's looking at me like, what are you doing inside my house? But I was invited right. by the victim. So, right. but that's, we're there just to create more of a peace than obviously um, we're not there to interfere in any way to make the situation any worse. Um, the, the court system, the whole process, and, um, and then for the victims to understand, the court process takes time because sometimes they think that it's a, it's, you want to court for one day and everything is done. So sometimes you're in court, it can take a year, it mm -hmm. can take months. We don't know how long the court system is going to take. So they get very discouraged. Um, and especially for immigrants who are um, here undocumented, there is not this. There, there, there are resources, but not so much for those who are here with a mass health. Um, they have a social security card. The resources, um, when it comes to somebody who's undocumented, is it's it's low, but there's resources out there. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of immigrants get um, discouraged and reported, or they think because of what their abusers tell them, I brought you into this country and yep. I'm going to send you back. Right. And, right. and they believe that. It goes into that self esteem. So they believe. So it's getting them to, to connect to someone where they can um, get, uh, I always call it know your rights. Yep. Because just because I put you here in America and you're still waiting for your documentation does not give me the right. To send you back, the old, I always tell people there's two people that can send you back. One is yourself. If you do something wrong, mm -hmm. you yourself can get the. You know, you do an act, a judge can deport you. Or two, if an immigration judge deports you, right? You can't do that. So it's just knowing what your rights are. Because I've had conversation with people that just come in and say, I don't want to report, but I want to know what my rights are. And believe me, and that's why um, when we did the advocacy is that we were in uniform because that makes people, unfortunately, police make people nervous. Yep. So we were in plain clothes and explained that. But I can see that I almost want to hold their hand and say, I'm not immigration. I'm not here to arrest you. But right. I need to know what your rights are. And that's the myth. That's a big myth around this issue is that if you do not have documentation, if you report to the police because your abuser is telling you day in and day out, if you do, you will get deported or I will get you deported. And that is not true. Correct. It's a big lie because and also their abuse is telling them, I put you here in America mm -hmm. and I can send you back. No, yes. they cannot send you back. So there's a big myth behind that. Um, so knowing what their rights are, knowing where the resources is at, knowing there's a restraining order, there's an advocate that can go with you. The Brockton Police Department has an advocate today that she can help you go to court. She can help you with any type of resources that is safe. And all we want to do is build that trust and making it safe for the people in the community to go forward. Right. And so not just, again, wherever you live, you are you are okay to call the non-emergency phone number for your local um, police department and ask anonymously, do you have a domestic violence department, someone in the, in the department that handles domestic violence? And beyond that, do you have a, uh, an advocate that can go with me to court? Like Elisa just pointed out, their department, their, their, the police station has someone that can go with you to court to fill out a restraining order. They themselves can help you fill out a restraining order. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Laverne, also when, um, in the Brockton Police Department, when we were doing um, domestic violence advocacy, we, believe it or not, and the Neighborhood Health Center has a lot of clientele too that come from out of town. Yeah. So we had other, we that the word got out, we had people from Boston, Taunton, New Bedford, Fall River. Even if that department does not have an advocate, can they connect you to one? Because Correct. We, if the department approves, we work with people out of Quincy. It's the comfort zone. We work with people out of Taunton. We work with people out of New Bedford, out of Boston. And yep. the point of that too is to get them back to reconnect into someone in their community. Like We're like a stepping stone and now we're going to resource them back to Boston, connect them yep. with an officer in Boston so they can work with someone in Boston. Um, but again, the I, I just saw somebody uh, point um, 
make a point here. I know that finance is a is a, a big, big factor. That's the Janine, the Janine prayer. Yeah, well, we do what we can do um, given what we have at hand. Um, you know, finance is always, always an issue, but we try to do what, what we can do best. Yep. So that's great. And we'll touch on this. I was going to uh, say, comment, but go ahead, Tina. I was going to say, and, and Lisa touched on a lot of the things that we see in like in our support groups, but um, Lenita also mm -hmm. pointed out the psychological abuse. And sometimes that is like the it worst, is. that psychological abuse the financial abuse, the manipulation. In our culture, I almost feel like that that trumps the physical mm -hmm. abuse. Sometimes it's so bad that the women don't even know they're being abused. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, so when we sit in these groups and we listen to women and sometimes we're trying to hold back because we don't want to be judgmental. We don't want to sound like we're judgmental. Lenita, you feel me, right? So we're just, <laughs> we hold back. We don't want to say anything. We're sitting in our seat like, oh my God. This woman's being abused and manipulated, but we don't want to scare them away because, again, we're building that trust. Right? So for us, this work is so hard because we understand the culture. We know what the issues are. We know how we can help, but we also have to tread lightly because we don't want to scare them away. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then as soon as we say something wrong, okay. it sounds like we're being judgmental and we push them away. Yeah. So it's not easy work. So I really commend you guys, but that's in the financial piece is huge, especially if they're not making enough money to support themselves and they have a couple kids, you know, it's just not easy. And so, so the Janine's um, comment to what you just said, Tina, is what I noticed as well as the financial dependency. Some women are so afraid of how they're going to support themselves after the breakup. And this is so true to the point that Elisa made in terms of immigration. This abuser has brought them from Cape Verde or wherever, whatever country that they may have come from. And they are sitting there wholly dependent financially um societally because they don't know anybody else um on this person and you know when they start experiencing this abuse they have zero people to lean in on and they don't know where to begin no. so we're telling you tonight that if you know someone in an abusive relationship and they've only talked to you don't tell them you know get out or you know girl run because that is scary they don't know what to do or how to begin to do that so three things find out what the domestic violence agency is in your area one an advocate there can start to talk to them and sort of build them up to that point where they feel confident enough that they're ready to leave they can help them safe plan they can then you can then reach out to the to, to, to your local police department and get an advocate there so that you know if they need to get things out of the house they can go with them they can help them file a restraining order so all these things sort of getting them comfortable reach out to tina if you're local to brockton to sort of get a support group around you with people that look like you and speak like you um candida if you need a little bit more coaching to talk about you know getting your mental health and getting that stuff out for samaritan's inc like i talked about earlier go to your neighborhood health center and look for lanera people like lanera they exist right so all of these things culminated and people you know again when people hear you know um somebody stuck in that type of relationship and they've may have gone through it and they got themselves out or whatever. They're like, girl, I'd never, that would never be me. I'd never. Never it's, say never. So, there's right. There's so many moving parts to leaving. Yeah. Leaving isn't just picking up and going, especially when you're from another culture. So thank you guys all for um, touching on that. Dejanine um, is, I believe she works for a bank. Um, yes. if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And then, so, you know, financial literacy, my gosh, they offer them free at um, your local banks, um, t showing you how to budget, how to um, create a, a master sort of plan for getting yourself where you need to be. Um, even if it, even if that need to be is like saving enough to get out, they can help you with that. Go into your, any of your local branches and ask them about that. So I'm going to move on to our next, um, uh, the issue of leaving and what sort of barriers keep people from 
leaving. So we talked about immigration. We talked about financial dependency. Um, we talked oh, about societal uh, being socially dependent on their abuser because they have nobody else to talk with. What are some of the other things that you guys see that keep people from even making that step? The shelter. The shelter. shelter. Yeah. Shelter. And, and I, think, I, think, I think another factor too is because uh, sometimes with victim is ready to leave and the abuser is threatening to stay with the kids. You can, if you leave, you're not taking my kids. Right. You know, and, and, you know, of course, you don't want to leave and leave your kids behind. And we did touch base in immigration, but immigration is so big. Yeah. And affects a lot, uh, a lot of victims in that community. I'm talking about pre-veteran community. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's so scary because you're being abused, but you don't want to report because you think if you report, you're going to get, you know, the person is going to get, you're going to get deported. deported. Right. And you you're yourself, yeah. making sure to tell you, you're going to get deported. And the worst thing is, is when you have an immigration appointment and your abuser is telling you the next day he's not going. Or in the same day that you're supposed to be in immigration at 8 o'clock, he's telling you, I am not taking you. And I'm talking about women or men. Men, men go through situations like this too. And I work with men yes. in the past that went through situations like this. Yeah. And it's just sad. It's just, it, it's the mental abuse is just too much. Yeah, I think I, I yeah. think it's very yeah. crucial when um, a victim, whether you're a male or female, you have decided that you want to leave, is to connect with someone like um, Candida, yes, and, and is to make a safe plan because the most dangerous time is for when, any right. victim is when they plan to leave because remember right. reality is kicking in. She or yes. he, they're really leaving. Yes. So right. along with the therapists making a plan with the therapist. And also with the help of um, your local police department, we can plan ahead of time, you know, remove children from the home. We always remove the children. And a good time to leave is when children perhaps are at a family member's house or at school, because children don't need to see all this. Mm -hmm. um, safe planning, so always plan ahead and know that these people, the therapy, the neighborhood health center, your counselors, the, um, the group that was mentioned earlier that would help you safe plan because it's a very, very dangerous time. That's when reality kicks in and a lot of times where abuse and you know, other sort of things take place is that yeah. to safe plan when you are planning on leaving and we can help you with that. We mean that everyone in the community can help you because that's the most dangerous time um, a victim faces because They've already, you know, they mentally made a decision they want to leave. Then when they're physically leaving, it creates violence. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, very point. Point. Go ahead, Tina. I was going to say, very good point. We've seen it all too many times yep. in our community where we have like murder suicides, mm -hmm. unfortunately, and children have been involved. And it's 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 most of the time, it's around this time when people decide that they're going to actually leave. Right, and they and have to put a plan into place. Yes, That's yes, really, and, really and the reason for that is because for abusers, that power and control, control. they've had over their victims, they see dwindling, yeah. and then yeah. when they leave, they they know that it's going to be down to nothing. So I would rather see you dead, harmed in in the worst way possible, if not dead, um, or over my dead body. Right. And mm -hmm. so that's when you see these, you know, news stories that say, you know, she was getting ready to leave or he was getting ready to leave. And, you know, mm -hmm. you know, then you hear the neighbors saying, I never noticed anything like that. My yeah. God, they always seem so nice. Trust and believe that didn't just happen that day. This no. was building up. Yep. Yep. She, 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 he or she noted to their abuser that they're, you know, they're planning on getting a divorce or they're taking the children because they're done and over with it. And they themselves, then the abuser, then made that choice that of what they wanted to do. So good points. Again, very important for you to get in touch with your local PD. They are not there to harm you, deport you, get your kids taken away. They want you to be safe. Go ahead, Lanera. You know, I just want to point out that people need to, to really look for help and don't, don't be scared. And um, even though if you're not ready to leave, just 
you know, like I, I do a lot of safety planning with uh, victims, you know, this is what you have, this is what you can do, this is, we don't make a decision for nobody. Mm -hmm. We tell them this, that is it. Okay, how do you want me to assist you? When you're ready, tell me how do you want me to assist you. And then another thing is that we need to tell people that if somebody comes to you and, you know, open up with you, tell you, you know, a husband or a girlfriend uh, or the wife, anything, you know, listen to it. You know, before, right. you know, we're so quick to judge yes. that we don't listen. Right. Listen right. to it. Even though if you don't know how to help, how to assist that person, listen to that person. And, you know, trying to find resources. You can guys can try to find resources together. You might not know, she might not know, but you guys together can find the resources. Because most of the time, if that victim comes to you and talk to you, it's because she's done, she's up to here. And yeah. she's so complicated that she wants to speak with someone and mm -hmm. she trusts you. If you shut her down or he, that's it. She's not yeah. gonna talk to you anymore. I'm she's so glad. Melanita, I'm glad you said that because when we started this program, we talked about our, our fallen soldier, uh, Elder Fernandez. Um, somebody, a friend of mine called me yesterday to talk about the situation and you know what she said and it stuck with me. She was like, as a, a community, we don't know how to listen. And you just, yeah. you just said the very thing she said, we don't know how to listen. We don't know how to validate what people are going through. And we're so quick to dismiss. We either judge or we dismiss what they're seeing. And we tell them, oh, it's going to be fine. Oh, go ahead. Like in what, what um, Laverne said, pray on it. Or yeah. we, we either dismiss it but I, or we judge them and make them feel like they're doing something wrong instead of listening and validating okay. what they're going through. So. But I yeah. think that the converting in culture in itself, one thing that we have to default is pride. Mm -hmm. And uh, resiliency. Resiliency is excellent. Resiliency cannot be taught. Mm -hmm. We are resilient. We are a culture mm -hmm. that is very resilient, and I take very good pride in it. But that resiliency sometimes is that dismissive kind of, yeah, yeah. you'll be fine. You know, you've gone through worse in your life. You can do this, right. you know, or, you know, it'll be okay, right? And mm -hmm. that, that, with that resiliency, that too much of that resiliency and within itself and pride to admitting that something is wrong or the resiliency or letting, putting that pride down and say, you know what, I'm going to listen to you. That's mm -hmm. its fault. We have that strength, but it's also, it's also our weakness at the same time. Yeah. Because I yeah. see that a lot within within domestic violence in itself. And to, to touch on why it's hard, um, oftentimes too, it's like when you come into, when you start to notice the red flags, all your personal belongings. I used to tell, you know, the women and men I worked with, if you have possession of valuable things, keep them in a safe space. Mm -hmm. Because those are some weapons that they can use. Passports, yes. uh, green cards. Um, mm -hmm. Those are belongings that, can be used to harm you, to threaten yep. you. And yep. if, if the last resort, honestly, if you can't go to the police, if you can't do anything, go. To, if you show up at the ER hospital and say you are suicidal, you haven't thoughts to harm yourself, they cannot turn you away. They have to, yes. to monitor you. So there is your safe heaven and you tell them, I do not feel safe to return home. At that point, they have to safely plan with you and figure out what they're going to yes. do with you. And so I, um, so that point can be a great point. Uh, and it goes with Imani's comment, who states, I facilitated domestic violence. A little piece of what I'm going to go backtrack a little bit of what you said. I facilitated domestic violence groups at Cambridge Family Court. A very important thing is to have duplicate IDs, money, bank account, birth certificates, social security cards, et cetera, in a place where they can be retrieved easily if a victim has to get away. Mm -hmm. That is all within safety planning, right? And someone that, you know, in the moment of trying to leave or escape, you can't think straight. Right. Mm -hmm. You are, you are gonna forget things. You are gonna not have everything in place. And that's what that what that's what a safety plan is, is is specifically sort of getting those documents together, making sure you have a little bit of a cash stashed away, having a burner cell phone um, stashed at a, a family member's house that he or she can't track um, uh, your digital footprint, like a burner phone that has minutes, prepaid minutes on it, all of that. All of that leads to safety planning. And then um, 
Candida, what did you say last year? I lost my train. I mean, the last resort, and I know it's utilizing oh. the system in terms of manipulating, but and unfortunately, I tell victims like and survivors, if you have that point where your life is in danger, you can show up to the ER hospital and say you're not safe. They will they have to you. you. They're, They're mandated. They're going to keep yeah. you for the night. They have DV beds at the mm -hmm. hospital and they will keep you there. And so yeah. the other thing is that, um, you know, sometimes if folks call me, the first thing I'm doing is trying to figure out what the resources are in their area. Unfortunately, a lot of the times DV beds are filled okay. up. There's yeah. nowhere to go. But don't let that be your last resort. Like you said, you can go to the ER, you can go to the police station and they will keep you overnight. OK, until you can figure it out. Love Life Now, as we're talking about resources, we have a fund called the Get Safe Fund that if you call us up, and I will put our number out there, 888-556-9876, um, we will put you up in a motel or a hotel for three, two to three nights so that you can continue to make calls to get shelter. Um, if you need food or transportation, any of those basic needs that is related to a domestic violence um, expense, we will help you. So don't let it be that, my God, I am stuck here. And there's nowhere that I can go. Um, uh, all, you know, all of, this is what I deserve. There is help available, but the power has to be put back in your hands. I think somebody, I can't remember who said it earlier. Well, that, Laverne, just to, just to go back on the documentation, because we've had victims who we talk about, um, it's important to, to have duplicates. Um, yes. But keep in mind, some people don't even have the access to making a copy. Mm. So just to keep in mind, because when the documentation comes in, for those who are new here into this country, a lot of the victims don't have access to their documentation because it's a form of control. Or even if you get into a relationship, what happens, they take those um, documentation, even the children's documentation, as a form of control. So just to know that they, if that does happen, it's unlawful to do that. So if a person takes, if for example, if I take Laverne's documentation and I'm holding on to it and Laverne says, I want my documentation, I'm telling her, no, you can be charged with that. Yep. Yes. So a lot of times is that they don't have, I've dealt with this so many times, like, oh, he has my green card, he has all my documentations, even the children's documentation. Um, and he won't, he won't give them to me or she won't give them to me. Believe me, we've been also dealing with men who are also dealing with this. It's just a little bit more difficult because yeah. if, the, if they're man who to come in and report it, but they have been reported, and particularly those who are new here and they're holding on to documentation, they're trying to go to work and they can't do nothing because it's a form of control. Mm -hmm. So just for those listening out there that if someone is holding your documentation and you can you cannot you know make copies, you can also always contact the police department. And what we try to do is come in easily and say, listen, you need to return those documentation because they do hold on to those documentation and you need to give them back so we can prevent. Again, we're always on the prevention side. We can prevent any type of charges. Yeah. But if someone is holding on to someone's documentation, and believe it or not, sometimes it's not only um, in terms of a spouse or you know a, a wife or a husband. Sometimes there's also family members. Like if somebody puts their mother and father here, they hold on to those documentation. Mm -hmm. You, you don't have that authority. You made the decision to bring somebody here to the United States. No one gave you the authority to hold on to the dog. It's like you're stealing someone's identity. You can't do that. So a lot yeah. of things, too, it does not only happen with husband and wife, boyfriend and girlfriend, is that they hold on to their parents or their sister's um, documentation and they won't give them back to them. So just to keep in mind, too, that domestic violence is not only your boyfriend, your husband. It could be anyone yeah. living in a household. Anybody that you have an intimate relationship relationship with yes yes, yes. um or, or you can be living inside the house with your mother and because i've seen people abusing their mother or mother abusing yeah. their children yeah. so you can't hold on to someone's documentation as a form of control amen yes. laverne can i ask the quick question um yes, with our kids being home you know for the last few months in these situations have you women lenita maybe you can speak to this um mm -hmm. Witness any uptick in 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 violent crime in in domestic violence and at home. Um, I just fear for the kids who have no outlet because they're not going to school. And what have you guys seen? And what are some things that that you can suggest for folks who are in that situation? Well, I've been having uh, since March that I've been home, 
uh, the numbers of domestic violence on our, our request has been increasing. And um, we are offering the same service that we did before. Of course, now due to the COVID, everything is to televisit. Uh, we've been given the resources, but as you know, most people, when they call, um, you can talk to them, you can see domestic violence through the signs they're giving it to you, but uh, you you have to catch up. When you work in the field, you catch up, you can see something is wrong, but they're talking to you about housing, they're talking to you about school, any other stuff, and then they throw a little bit there, oh yeah, and any drinks. Oh, he, 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 he went out yesterday, he came home, he was screaming at me. So you have to pick from that and then go, you know, to explore some more. From there, yeah. And exploring some more sometimes is very difficult because, you know, sometimes they're so shut down and sometimes they're so scared they don't want to give you more. But one of the one of the tricks, I call them tricks, you know, if you talk to me about housing and then you throw that, you know, that's a red flag for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know how to work with you. I've been in the field for a long time, so I know that this, this victim right here, I need to do extra because she has more that she's gonna tell me later. So she's just gonna give me pieces. So we be referring a lot of patients to FNCR, okay? And um, it's been very, very hard to get a bed with safe link. And okay. uh, it's COVID-19, but you know, unfortunately people so wanna leave, but again, this we don't have no shelter. Right. I'm, right. The kind of, I'm the kind of person to tell, tell people, you know what, go to the emergency room. You, yep. can there. you know, you know, what's a big factor that can help people leave mm -hmm. a restraining order. Yes. That that's been solving a lot of the problem, because if you have someone who's a victim, the courts have been shut down. But we've been doing a lot of virtual mm -hmm. um, um, uh, restraining orders at the police oh, department good. or the courthouse mm -hmm. is doing it. In the beginning of the, all this, we we did it, a lot of it at the police station. But uh, as as we all know, they face in all these barriers. The, the, the call volumes are tripling. The issues yeah. are, you met, no, some of them couldn't get along before the virus. Never mind what the virus. Right, so right, now, right. Now, when we're right. inside a house, then you feel like you have to leave. It's just a tool. Right. We we put the tools out there, and then yeah. the people have to require the tools. Yeah. Is that sometimes you don't have to leave? And under restraining order mm -hmm. guidelines, number three says that if you remove, if you have the defendant, um, if the defendant is removed from the home, they still have to provide financial support. And financial support does not mean they're gonna you're gonna go out and, and shop on their credit card. That's not a financial support. Financial support means you're gonna pay your rent, you're gonna right. pay your utilities, you're gonna keep the basics going. Right. In terms of um, you know, helping that household, because I always say if there's a problem, and keep in mind, it's not my opinion. This is the law, and we're going by what the restraining order guidelines are. So then you have to remove and you know the problem from the home because where is that lady or that man going to go with three or four children mm -hmm. facing these barriers with the virus? Mm -hmm. So restraining orders, even though we're facing this epidemic with the virus, is that yeah. you still can get a restraining order. Yeah. Again, come down to the police department. If you go to the courthouse, um, they will meet you at the door and give you what resources that they're offering because right now what they're doing is a lot of virtual, um, like we're doing now. Mm -hmm. A lot of right. virtual um, conversations and handling with the courts because you still can obtain a restraining order because we have to keep people safe. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Yeah. To answer your questions, the service are still in place. It's yes. Because everything now is so slow. You know, all the process are so slow, but you know, it's still service for the victims. We just want them to know that it, they're not they're not alone. We're here to assist them. We're here to help them. Exactly. Yeah. So there's, been, there's been at least two uh, folks that I've come into contact with that um, filed restraining orders over the phone. Mm -hmm. um, and again, different sort of setup, but it's still in place and they are get they are granting them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, services are still yeah. in place. So so one of the, go ahead, Tina. I was just going to say, when I was doing the support groups, Candida has come to our support groups to speak, I, I could access Laverne, I could access Elise, I could ask, you know, I had people to come. Um, but now since we have to stop the support groups, there's, I'm a little disconnected with the, with the women that used to join. And we tried to do the virtual platform and have the women log in, but it doesn't work in our community. It's hard.
to run support groups um, virtually. So I'm glad that we had this conversation and that those services are still in place. And I'm glad you guys are putting it out there. And Lenita, you said something important about us doing this in Creole. Mm -hmm. One day. It would be nice if yeah. we can do something like this in Creole. One day, no, soon. We should do it soon. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So thank you, Laverne, and thank you, everybody. And I oh, want yes. to touch up on the immigration part. So there's two yes, types please. of visa that a undocumented woman, actually, or men, who is under the process of domestic violence and sexual assault. So the VAWA visa, if, if you your spouse is a citizen, so if your spouse that you're married with holds a citizenship, you are granted by sort of, it was a, the VAWA foundation, the VAWA visa was created back in 2000 and then it got implemented to, mm -hmm. to 2012 because yes. the drama took place. There was a, a huge influx of uh, violence and they created that funding specifically for um, survivors and victims of sexual abuse and domestic violence that if your spouse is a, hold a citizenship you can apply for that um, type of visa the u visa if it's the person has a green card so if your spouse has a green card you can apply to that um in the t visa if it's you've been uh you've been human trafficked so through the human trafficking so there's a t visa the u visa and the vow visa but those process have helped women in the community i'm telling you it, it works it's it very works. very very, very difficult process that needs mm -hmm. a lot of multiple disciplinaries to come together. Unfortunately, yeah. there's a shortage of immigration lawyers because you need actually to present that case with an immigration lawyer. And sometimes the charge of the immigration lawyers is really, really high because that's how they make them money. Honestly, so I, have, I want to shout out real quick, woman of color, immigration lawyer right in Brockton. Her yes. name, her, the name of her, um, uh, uh, practice is Brazen Legal. Her name is Bianca yeah. Jordan. She is right here, right there in the city. I'm in Avon, but she's right in the city of Brockton um, and can be accessed. She runs a YouTube. It's called Brazen Legal and she answers questions every week. Again, there is so many resources, so many resources out there. We have um, Justice Center too, right on Main Street. Yes, yeah, right on Main Street. Uh, mm -hmm. Bianca Jordan and again, out of Brazen Legal. So I want to touch on um, Dulce's uh, comment, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name, Dulce. Um, it's D-U-L-C-E. Am I saying that right, guys? Dulce. 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 Okay. So she says, you know, as it relates to immigration um, appointments or law, uh, you know, going to an appointment. She says, if you or someone you know is in an abusive relationship and needs support, call MAPS, M-A-P-S dash M-A, um, Alliance, Mass Alliance of Portuguese Speakers. So you need an interpreter, they got you, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll put the number out there so that people can see that as well. Um, thank you, Dulce. I appreciate you. Um, Gisela says, some people don't understand English. Is any possible... Um, Oh, to get, and we already talked about that. Lanera mm -hmm. said that you guys are going to do this in Creole yeah. at some point. Yeah, we could. Yep. And then, you know, do um do the same program. Um, That would be a great discussion to have, Imani says. So, um, not being deterred, just sort of connecting to your, I mean, and if you reach out to one, a lot of the times, they'll point you in the direction of all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so not to get people inundated with information. I always say, start at the ground level, find your domestic violence agency in your area, and then they can start sort of spanning you out. A lot of the times they're bilingual. They have somebody to to speak the language that needs to be spoken, especially if a community has a lot of Cape Verdeans, they will have somebody more than likely, right? right. <laughs> that speaks the language. If it's more, it's if it's Haitian um, drenched, they will have a, 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 a Creole speaking person on hand. And again, from there, they can then span you out to all the other services. So if you leave here with nothing else, reach out to your local domestic violence agency and I'm not, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the local ones for Brockton and the, the surrounding neighborhood is Health Imperatives, mm -hmm. which oversees Penelope's Place Domestic Violence Shelter, as well as Family and Community Resources, both out of Brockton. So please do not stay in a, in a relationship because you feel that there's no support and nobody will understand. 
please reach out to someone. I have one more question. Um, or maybe this is a comment. The Justice Center, yes, so that's fine. And and again, the, the DB agency can point folks in, in, in that direction too. The just, I actually have someone right now that we are working together with, with the Justice Centers um, for lawyer services. She's trying to get a divorce, is stuck because the abuser has a good high-powered attorney and she has zero. And the Justice Center has a very, very affordable lawyer that she's now working with to help her get this divorce. So the Justice Center in Brockton, tell Thelma, Thelma from FCR is joining us. Okay, <laughs> Thelma was supposed to be on this panel, but you know, whatever. I love you, Thelma. <laughs> Thelma says the Justice Center in Brockton also provides pro bono legal services for a variety of issues, um, yes. including immigration. So divorce, restraining order, you name it, um, uh, immigration, all of that. They cover all of that. And they have a network of lawyers that you can have access to. Um, Gisela says, thank you all for this information. Um, I And so, oh, this is great. So K-Love says, I started off with a tear-off leaflet on the bathroom door of a hospital. Hmm. You never know where somebody's gonna get that info or that push or that di direction of where to go. She said, it started there. My life has changed for the better since then. So you, if you are stuck in a relationship, please know that you have support. You are yeah. not to blame for this. You yeah. didn't bring this on yourself. You didn't ask to be abused. This is not your fault. No matter what your mama said or your grandmama said, or I'm sorry, how do you say um, Nana in, in, in Portuguese? Is it Vovo? Vovo. 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 I got I got some Portuguese going. Okay, all right. So, yeah. that, no matter what your Vovo said, none of that matters, right? Yeah. In the here and now, you know what you're going through is wrong, and there mm -hmm. is help available. And that's I, I think the, the greatest point that we can put out. I especially, am especially in Brockton, I want to say, Laverne, we have a lot of great resources. There's a lot of great people that take their time, like the women on this call tonight, to do this work that really care about the city and care about helping people. And yes. so there's, there's just an abundance of resources here. But I think we as a community have to do a better job in getting information out there as best we can. So... I appreciate this conversation. I look forward to more. We can't let COVID-19 stop us. I know it's been it's been hard, but this is so important. So thank you. Yeah. Um so is there anything else um I'm going to I'm going to sort of go uh, across the board from each avenue where you guys are from um and just ask specific to where you are two resources that you can point out specific to what you do. You don't have to name where you work. Um, I'll just name the industry. Um, and so Leonera from the top, uh, where you work at a health center, what and, and what you do in the community, what two res resources can you provide for folks tonight in the Cape Verdean community? Experiencing uh, abuse. Uh, well, uh, one of the places that I always refer is the FSR. And FCR. yeah, Telma was there, so Telma works there, so it will be FNCR and uh, you say two, yes, FNCR and so FCR is a domestic violence agency located in, in Brockton, yeah. Massachusetts. Yeah, mm -hmm. and if people does not want to, a lot of people does not want to go for counseling, but right in the court, safe the planning is on the second yes. floor, right? So, mm -hmm. yes. people can go there, get a restraining order, they have somebody that can take you in front of the judge. Accompany you on front of the judge to give you as a support or you know whatever you need, they there to help too. Perfect, uh, Elisa, you're next, and Elisa is a um, police officer. So you're uh, uh, look, look. I just want to point this out real quick. As it relates to police officers, why isn't that great? Right, right now, <laughs> right, right. You guys are not getting a whole ton of love, but I also do want to point out the really positive images that I've seen, not just through Elisa, but from other officers that have helped me with DV cases right. uh, that have been that really positive. Positive. Yes. So go ahead, Elisa. Two resources out of the police department. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Alisa Fons. I am a Brockton police officer. Um, very, very strong into resourcing and helping out 
anyone in the community, and particularly those who are misguided or misinformed, to basically know what your rights are, because a lot of people are just so misinformed and they basically don't know that you can't, if you're undocumented, you still can um, come in, um, mm -hmm. get the support. Yep. Um, so the support that I say that is a great resource, I, I, I start up top. We have, we have Tina, which is, I, I'm top meeting from um, within the city of Brockton, is go and start to talk to, like, but there's a lot of issues with funding. You know, mm -hmm. when we have these issues, and it may, it may be difficult to talk about, but we need to talk about them without mentioning names. We could just mention circumstances. So like that, people can see like this is, you have people at the top and not meaning in city councils, but anyone in any organization that you're at the top and you have people at the bottom who are, who are doing all the work and who are, you know, you're face to face with a victim. So I'm face to face with a victim and I'm telling them I can't find you a shelter. So it's very, very important to reach out to the political leaders to say we need to have these resources put into place. Um, and it's connected, we connect with a lot of people. So just to mention too, it's, it's kind of difficult, but we, we connect with Neighborhood Health Center, um, with, with everyone. Hmm. A lot of our clientele did come from the um, Neighborhood Health Center because it's that comfort level that they built with um, their staff there and would trickle down to, you know, is it okay for me to call off the fonts? Um, and word of mouth. So I think our biggest resource, and especially now, as you mentioned, with the barriers and policing, is that I hope, I pray that I've never offended anyone. I don't think I have, but if I have, is that um, it, it was probably you know meant well. Not probably. It was intention, not done intentionally, but it's for the safety of everyone. Because sometimes you need to be truthful with some of these clients, mm -hmm. and, and it might be hurtful, but it's uh, it's something that we have to face truthfully. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you or sugarcoat anything. Is that um, it's it's hard. It's hard as we face um, these barriers with police, and is to know that you can come to us and we will refer you out, you know, but um, mental health, the mental health, it, it could trickle down to a lot of things is that um, I can refer, and, and when I say mental health, it's kind of a little bit difficult because they want someone who's K-verted, but then how are you going to communicate with someone when you don't really speak the language? Call um, maps. Yes, so you, they can call maps, but even so, when you tell them they, they're going to refer to someone who's k and some of them may not want someone who's exactly. k because right. their story might go out. So it's like, all right, I know Candida. So if I'm telling you, you can trust Candida, please trust her. Just give her that benefit of the doubt. Is yeah. to go out there mentally. I think it has to stop, I guess, mentally. So once they, uh, they step out of that barrier of a safety issue and you're starting to put in place a safe plan and how to get the resources, there's a mental component that needs to be worked on so they can get up from bed and start to go and, um, you know, tackle these resources. So there's so many resources that we can guide them to. And then also know that financially is that, um, for example, we have uh, attorneys at the courthouse as well. Then there is, a, I forgot his, his name, but we have um, uh, legal services downstairs at the courthouse. They can help you fill out paperwork because sometimes we go to our own people and they're charging you $200, $300 to fill something out that sometimes we can help you if we can, or we can refer you to legal that will do these documentations for you for free because there's other agencies that are charging and knowing that you're in this financial burden in, in this circumstance and they're still charging, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, is, is to build that trust with someone that all I can give you is my word and only time will build that trust with someone. Um, is yeah. basically what we can stop. I was gonna say, Lisa, I'm so glad you touched upon the elected officials because we all know that these programs are underfunded. We know mental health is underfunded. We know that we have a lot of great people in this city that could take jobs in these areas, but they go and take jobs in Boston and other places because we don't pay enough. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of like, I think it's Candida. <laughs> Candida's fabulous. But Candida has a mortgage, right? And Trilingual. So I'm, I'm so amazed. Trilingual. So we need someone like Candida. Instead right, of having her locally, we have her somewhere else. That's right. 
but we don't pay. Right. And there's not enough funding for this stuff. And so um, that's important that people write to their to their city councilors, they write to their state delegates, they advocate for more domestic violence, preventative programs, mental health services in this city. And we need it. We have a lot of issues here. So that was very important you said that. Laverne, thank you for touching on the police. My brother's a cop. I love you guys. I'm sorry for, for all that's going on because there are some great people. My brother's a wonderful police officer. Um, kind of <laughs> um, so there are great police officers. We do have some issues. We have to work through those issues. We want yes. people to trust our police so that they can go to them. So we do have to work on that. I want to plug Inclusion Family Therapy, yes. Adriano Cabral, yes. my brother. I love him. He does great work for the city. And he has clinicians that speak all types of languages. So I thank him for being here. I thank all of you guys for all the great work that you do. You're all great resources. People can call me. Laverne, you can put my number up if you want. Um, for people to call me, we will start our support groups up as soon as it's safe to do so, and we will continue this work. So thank you, ladies, very much. That is awesome. And so um, just to recap, and I do want to give uh, credence to some of the comments that uh, came in as you guys were talking. Um, and so MG, going with the initials there, absolutely indeed, she says, to add being trauma informed is really important. Negative interaction or past events to a victim's childhood or experiences. We talked about these earlier, MG, I think before you joined, can have a huge impact on their decision. And really, it's the legacy of abuse that's passed down or the legacy of that mindset that's passed down that we talked about earlier, right? Um, that they have a huge impact on the decision to get help, disclose, and or trust others. There's also a huge lack of training and trauma informed practices across the country. And yes, indeed, um, you know, it's not perfect, right? This, um, you know, sometimes people call and I hear, I hear all the time, you know, they, you, you've put a resource in front of folks, you're pushing the resource, pushing the resource. And then somebody calls and they have a really negative experience um, with said resource. And that's the last thing that you want, because again, in that moment, um, that person may not go back to try to right. get help. They will go back to the abuser. It takes on average, really, um, a victim seven to 10 times to leave. So if it's the time that they've gotten to their breaking point for real, and they have a negative experience, that's the last thing that you want. So, you know, more training is needed across the board from police stations down to even agencies sometimes, right? Um, so we're not going to discount that there. Uh, Marita says, hi, Candida. MG says, together as a community, working in partnership can help overcome the challenges and barriers victims face. And this is what that looks like. Partnerships like this, where we're all sort of communicating with each other. I have called Elisa many times and said, girl, I need help. This person needs help. She's afraid. She needs to know she's not she can go pick up her stuff. How can you help? I've called Lanera. I've asked Lanera for advice. I've called Tina and I said, you know, this person I think would be, you know, that you can speak to. Candida, you and I, uh, we met officially during our uh, on walk. Yeah, walk in heels, right? And so it's just community coming together. Th Thelma, I have brought physically a victim to um, a, a, um, a, a intake appointment because they didn't have transportation. It's all about community, okay? Um, and so keeping that out there, uh, Don Gisela says, what about if they live in RI? So I'm not sure what you mean, Gisela, if you can clarify. Rhode Island. Um, Rhode what? Island. Rhode yeah, Island. no, I know, I know RI, but it, what, what, to what extent is it immigration? Is it like, what are you talking yeah. about if they live in RI? Donna, probably Donna LeClaire, um, who used to live uh, on the South Shore before, I think she lives in Florida now, um, says this, this webinar was so informative and much needed. Much love to you, Donna. Thanks to all who organized and great panel. We appreciate you. Oh my gosh, I'm going to screw up this name. If you guys can see that, First name. Oh, so, <laughs> God have the need. Yeah. 
Okay, I'll leave it with you guys because everybody <laughs> said it a little, a, just a little bit different. Okay. And she said, Hi, Lucinia, we love you. We love you. We love you. <laughs> she says, thank you all for this information. I work with teenagers 24 and under. And sometimes we're stuck on where to direct them and when to deal with these problems. Yeah. Um, so yeah, 24 and under. Um, I'd love this is a great resource for uh mm -hmm. that age group. Love is respect loveisrespect.org it is a teen dating violence website you can text to chat you can pick up the phone and call um and it you can be all confidential but it it it, it targets that demographic really well and if they go on the website it's translated um in any language if the, if they need it um and they can get resources as it relates to teen dating violence so again we will be putting out all of these resources in the comments and I'll pin it to the top so that people can always access them. Um, but share this with someone that you think may need uh, just a little bit of an edge, a push to, to have them see themselves in these Criolas to understand that they're not alone and that there's help available across the board. So thank you. We went a little bit overboard, but that's okay. Everybody enjoyed it. And that's the most important thing is getting the awareness out there. So thank you. Everyone. Mm -hmm. Is, Laverne, somebody had mentioned something about Rhode Island and I just, um, because there oh. are a lot of Cape Verdeans um, who live in Rhode Island. Yeah. So if anyone who lives in Rhode Island and um, need the resources, they can always contact us. I've, I've contacted Rhode Island Police Department. We've yes. had cases that stemmed out is, um, as far as New York. Yeah. Um, incidents have taken place in New York and, and, you know, they come back. So you can live in Rhode Island, you can live in New York, you can live in any part of the world. If you need the help, you can always call us. We're, we're all in different fields and we can help you. If there's police department, there's mental health, there's health centers, there's city councils, um, yep. there's organization like what you have in Laverne. So whether you live in Rhode Island or where you live at, um, yeah. if we can be of help, you know, to save someone, please contact us. Yes. Um, real quick, um, we are so going over, but that's okay because people are <laughs> loving this, and that's what we want. Um, Maggie, who is oh, over Maggie. at Phil. Yes, yes, Maggie's Maggie. wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Shout out to Maggie. We Maggie. love Maggie. We do love I Maggie. Love her. She <laughs> says, excellent job, ladies, with the exception of Tina. <laughs> I have worked with you all. She's saying that she's worked with everyone except Tina. Um, oh, do that, do that, Josh. <laughs> no, 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 no. She needs to health imperative. She's worked with everyone um, it, on the panel. And it, it, they're very lucky to have each um, and every one of you uh, who are all caring advocates, including Tina. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, as it relates to RI, very quickly, now I understand the, 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 the direction of the question. So mm -hmm. Jenna House is a domestic violence agency in Rhode Island that they can reach out to as well. So if you don't feel comfortable reaching out to the PD down there, you can also reach out to Sojourner House. They do have bilingual um, rep advocates there as well. I've dealt with them personally. So yes. Please, please, please point them in the right direction. I will put all of this in the comments. I want to thank each of you. We're so over. Um, but I thank you so very much for all of your insight. We, we can't, we, listen, we will never be able to cover all of the issues because domestic violence is so complex. It is not a black and white issue. Um, and I, I don't think we'll, uh, we'll ever cover all of it. But please know that each of these elements in us are here to support you. All right, I wanna thank you. And as always, I wanna, each and every one of you that's tuned in and, and, and shared this to continue to love life now. Thank you guys, we'll thank see you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.